Welcome to Eastman's podcast edition. I'm Mike Eastman. Today I have a special guest, Maddie Nelson from Seekins uh, Precision, and uh, we're going to talk about who Maddie is. If you have, if you don't know who Maddie is, <laughs> go follow him on on, on social media because it's entertaining, if nothing else. Um, you're full of energy, Maddie, and I'm I love that part. And one of the best, he taught me how to shoot an AR, and one of the best I've ever seen. It's unreal, unbelievable. Uh, we did it at Glen Everly's out there event. Yeah, super, so much super fun. fun. Did, you, did you go this year? I did. Yeah. So they invited me back out. I love going out there and and being able to instruct. That's one of my favorite things to to be able to do is just help guys get a little bit better. They've been shooting a long time, a lot of times, and there's some a, a couple of different things and a couple of different tricks to help people go to the, you know, take their shooting to the yeah. next level and be that much that much faster and that much quicker and have that much more fun. Yeah, so. that was that was a blast. I've, I I had really, I mean, I've shot ARs, but never actually understood the, the process and what you guys did. So was, that was fun. I appreciate it. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that was cool. So, Maddie Nelson, where did where did you grow up? Where where'd you where what what bring Matt Maddie Nelson into the world? <laughs> so I grew up actually right here. So we're at the Western Hunt Expo. I grew up here in, in uh, just south of Salt Lake City. In did Oregon, you really? Utah. I did. Yeah. Oh. So uh, I grew up there. I played a bunch of sports. My parents were super into. Um, uh, they told me when I was young, like, we will pay for any hobby. We'll pay for any crazy thing you want to do, but we're never going to pay for a Nintendo. All right. And so I said, I love your parents already. I don't yeah, even know I'm them. A big fan. Yeah. So, uh, so I took that to heart. We did, uh, I played a lot of baseball, a lot of basketball all through high school. I was on the high school team there at, at Mountain View down there. So, yeah, yeah. Go, go Bruins. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, um, and then we like dabbled in all kinds of other stuff, lots of outdoor sports. My dad was a, was a big outdoorsman guy. We did, we mountain biked everywhere. We did, like, he didn't like, uh, motorized vehicles because they're too noisy so we always got on a mountain bike and nice. we all over southern utah and red rocks and and just had a real good upbringing where i was outside and and had to be self-reliant in a lot of different situations but then um also just got to figure things out and and learn from good examples uh, uh, of my dad and how to you know how to make stuff happen to get stuff done not just sit on a couch and so you hunted from the beginning you so it's 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 a funny story about hunting actually i didn't start hunting until after i got out of the military oh, really yeah so i grew up my dad grew up at a little bit different time with and he was in a little bit different scenario where he was the sole source a lot of times he's the oldest boy in his family he was the sole source of like hey we're not having dinner tonight because my dad didn't bring home whatever he was supposed to go get. really and that was a lot of pressure on him as a, as a young man and he made it kind of his goal in life to be always, I will be able just to go to the store and get what I want to get and not have yep. to rely on that. Um, so he grew up hunting and had to take it very seriously, but it was a lot of, a lot of pressure for, for, you know, a 10, 11, 12, 13 right. year old boy to be like, Hey, you're responsible for dinner this yeah. week. And if you don't get it, then we ain't eating. Right. Right. Um, so uh, I didn't go hunting a lot as, as, as a kid growing up, I went on a couple of different trips with some family friends and some things, but never really got super serious about it until after I got out of the military. Really? Yeah. That's, that's crazy. So, so you, yeah, did, you did all kinds of outdoor stuff, but never, yeah, never hunting, tons camping of outdoor and stuff. surviving camping, and all that yeah. stuff. Yep. Lots of different activities um, where we were out, you know, on the mountain for weeks at a time, but none of it was, Hey, let's go figure out how to get this deer. Let's go, right. let's track these elk. Let's do right. this. It was always a little bit different, different base just because of his, his, his upbringing. So, yeah. so high school, then you went in the military. I, I, that yeah. is one of the coolest stories I've heard in a long time is how th your military experience. I got super lucky. So I, 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 so I did high school and then went on a, on a uh, mission for the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day States for two years in Brazil um, and got really fluent in Portuguese, which came back to bite me later. For, <laughs> in, uh, in the, <laughs> you know the story, so that's why you're, you're laughing. But... <laughs> but uh, Dang and it, then, if I only didn't know Portuguese. Right? Like, oh, <laughs> hey. I th yeah, anyway, so um, I went to college, and it just it just was a terrible fit. And so I originally – they don't even have this around anymore. I originally joined the military under an 18-month contract. Okay. And it was – they just needed bodies in Iraq. Like, you signed up. You did three months of basic training. You went to Iraq for 12 months. You came back. You did three months of demob, and you were out. That was and, it. This is the Army. It was the Army, yeah. Okay. Uh, and I walked into the, to the recruiting office, and I said, I want to be that guy on the wall. Right there. And they're like, well, we don't have any of those spots. We have, you know, a truck driver or a pastry chef or whatever they have going on. <laughs> um, yeah, right. You'd be good at yeah. that. <laughs> so <laughs> so it's, a, it's a venereal disease. There you go. Have that for dinner. So, <laughs> but, but, uh, so they, they, they worked around and I got in as, a, as an 11 Bravo, which is just an infantryman for this 18-month program. 
Um, and halfway through basic training, I was lucky enough to have a drill sergeant kind of pull me aside and said, hey, you're a little bit older than a lot of the guys here. You're in way better shape. You got a little bit of leadership skills. Let's try and develop that a little bit. Let's send you to, let's change your contract, make you an 18 x-ray and send you to selection right out of basic training. So uh, I did a little bit of homework. They let me, you know, get some books and some literature on, you know, special forces and green right. berets and what do they do? And I was like, man, that looks like a, it looks like it's tailor made for, for yeah, what I want to do. Looks like so last. I changed my contract and never looked back. Went to airborne school right out of basic, went straight to selection, um, and was, you know, lucky enough to, to fit the build that they need and get all the way through that program. And then, uh, fast track through the Q course and got onto a team and, and, had a blast for 10 years, man. Did never As a Green Beret. As a Green Beret, yeah. So, so I got I, super lucky right off the street. So I, I asked Glover this yesterday. I'm going to ask you too because I don't because What's the hardest? Green Beret, Delta Force, SEALs, what's the hardest? The hardest? Uh, I've heard it. So, so there's different tiers within the Army, right? Like the best way I've ever heard it described is like it's a big fountain, it's a big pool, right? So yeah. you have like basic infantry is the bottom of the fountain, big pool. There's a lot of people there. Airborne's a little bit more elite. Rangers are a little bit more elite. Green Berets are a little bit more elite. Now you're getting towards the top. That's a pretty small little pool. Right. And then Delta's right at the top for the Army side. Um, as far as, like, who's the biggest and baddest that's out there, <laughs> the best way I've ever heard it put, and we'll probably catch some flack for it, if you want to get in <laughs> bar fights, it's the SEALs. If you want to shoot dudes, it's Delta. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's mission specific. Yeah, yeah, right? It's, it's, yeah, depending on which one you want to go. So I'm just joking. Like, that's not that's, – that's, it's, we all tease each other. We rib each other. Like, thank goodness to the gods of war, we're all yep. really good at something else yep. because without fail, one branch or the other – in those elite circles has come to the aid of one with a yeah. specific skill set that bailed yep. us out of trouble. So That's right. That's the right. reason I loved being a green beret is I got to teach. I got to be a force multiplier. I got to, I got to be really, really good and master the basics of what I needed to do, but then right. also pass that on to somebody else to be like, Hey, this is how you do all of these tasks. This is how you achieve all of these different goals to be able to go out there and accomplish a mission and to be able to instruct that and help guys grow into that partner nation forces our own guys other green berets everything else it was i, I absolutely loved that part yeah of and you're a good green teacher Beret. take it from me you taught me how to shoot an ar you're a good teacher <laughs> really good at it oh, and thank you you're doing you're doing stuff with brian too right long yeah. distance yep so, so i still I, I i got lucky enough to be super serious about uh long distance shooting and i was a sniper for seven of the 10 years i was at group wow um not always as a designated as a designated sniper uh, on like on a white side oda you kind of have to fit a lot of different bills so i was the weapon sergeant and then also sniper qualified and halo qualified a bunch of other stuff um but depending on what the mission was then that would bleed in really well to hey we need an overwatch position for this or whatever and then the last couple of years i was in i was in the sif company um which still doesn't exist or does exist depending on where you're at who you talk to <laughs> funding is here funding's not there whatever uh but i got to be just a dedicated sniper for those guys which was awesome i got paid to shoot long distance and skydive for the last two years i was in that's awesome and uh was good enough at it that when i got out um I was, you know, good friends with Brian, and and he he brought me out, and I got to be a, you know, one of his primary instructors for, I've known him for, you know, 10, 15 years now, yeah. and had a blast, and it's yeah. super fun to give back to that soft community, guys coming in that are, you know, maybe been snipers for a long time in their career, and there's new tricks and there's new things that are coming out that we get to pass on to those guys. Yeah, all the different, you know, laser range finders and all the new equipment and all the new gear and goo right. that's coming out is. is you know, cutting edge stuff that maybe their their team isn't clued in on just yet. So we get to help them with that as well as new guys that are coming in that are still, you know, like, which way is the scope going here? Okay. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a good broad the spectrum. Bullet goes the other way. Yeah. Right. Oh, it goes this way. Got it. Okay. Sweet. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. So it's super fun to be able to instruct and, and, and teach and give back to that special operations community that I, that I came from. I love that. Yeah. So that's cool. So you got it. So you, we walked through your military, but you got to tell the story. You gotta tell the Brazilian. The story. Brazilian jungle schools. So I, uh, so I spoke Portuguese fluently, and yeah. I was on my first deployment. And uh, the sergeant major came out to visit our little fob we were at, and uh, I didn't know it at the time, but he'd come out just to, just to find me. So there was one of our two star generals and uh, one of their two or three star generals, whatever. They were gonna send some guys to Ranger School, and they wanted to send a guy to Brazilian jungle school. So <laughs> they. They did some asking around at seventh group, like, hey, who speaks Portuguese? And they're like, well, there's this big, huge, you know, six foot four ginger kid that <laughs> speaks okay Spanish, but he's really good at Portuguese. So he came out to our fire base and he was like, hey, you're Nelson, right? And I was like, oh boy. Like, uh -oh, Roger, that's that's never major. good. <laughs> yeah, right. That's what I do now. Um, <laughs> I didn't think the predator was up there for that. Oh. But uh, no, I was just, <laughs> just kidding. But, 
<laughs> but uh, um, so you speak Portuguese, and I was like, I that depends on why you're asking. <laughs> why? It's our major. So he said, Well, I got a school for you. You're going to get voluntold, and you're and you're going. So I said, Okay. So he said, It's called SIGS. Do some homework on it. You're going to go right when we get back from this deployment. So uh, I started doing some homework on it, and the more homework I did on it, the more I realized that like I was not going to be a super f- like it's a super fun story to tell now but the course was, was not quite so fun yeah quite stringent um so it ended up being uh down in brazil it's called sigs the the and i'm gonna murder because i haven't spoke portuguese in a while but it's uh centro de instrução de guerra na selva which is the center of instruction for jungle warfare and it's one of their top tier things like anybody that somebody in the brazilian army wants to go and graduate this course so we started the first week. We had like 600. So are you an instructor here? No. I got asked to come back and be one after I had been a candidate. But 7th Group said, no, we're not going to cut you loose for uh, six months. you got to come back. Uh, so the course was four months long. And uh, so I got down there. And the first week, we had like 640 candidates. There were five foreigners. There was oh a kid God. from Guyana who was like shorter than this table um <laughs> and if person. yeah if, if you're listening it's like you know two and a half feet i mean he was the he was the tallest midget i was ever gonna meet right and he was from guyana and he spoke zero portuguese and they were like oh he speaks english you'll be his partner he didn't speak english either um and then there were two kids from peru there was this old guy this old mountain their version of a green beret mountain instructor from spain and then there was me so the two kids from Peru failed the five mile run, and I'm pretty sure they did it on purpose because they were like, like we're, "We're out, out. we're going to die here, right?" Like, Whoop, we're going back. It's, it's, it's we've good heard enough stories. Where we are. Yeah. <laughs> so they're out, and uh, I came in like there was, there was a lot of cats, 640 guys, and I came in fifth on the five mile run because oh I got my gosh, I got some pretty long getaway sticks, and so that turned some heads, um, and then there was a <laughs> it was a five kilometer surface swim in full uniform. So we're swimming, and I came in dead ass last on that <laughs> one, right? Like, they hit the whistle. And yet these dudes, like, take off like it's the Olympics. And I'm like, you know, monkey airplane <laughs> banana, like, just on my back, you know? Like, how much time I got? All right, I mean, I made the cutoff by, like, 30 seconds, but I made it through. And then there was, a, there was an 18-mile ruck, and it was nine miles out, turn around, come nine miles back. And that's what washed out the Guyana kid. And then um, it was just me and the Spaniard that made it through that one. But on that ruck... Every mile, they had several instructors there. And I was number 29 for four months. So I yeah. guess that was my number. So, but they had, you know, one to 600 numbers. So you'd run by that mile marker. They had a bunch of dudes there with clipboards. You'd just yell your number at them. They'd mark you off. You'd keep going. It was every mile. Right. So I came in fifth in the run and then dead ass last in the swim. But then in the ruck, I was like, all right, guys. Like, I, I, it this, was is, only, this is what we do. Yeah, I, I got this <laughs> down, right? So it was only 45 pounds dry. So I made sure I had like 50 pounds in my pack because I knew I was going to smoke it. And they were going to get super serious about this is did he make weight did he not make right, weight so right. I plus it by five pounds and then uh took off and there was a group of about 10 guys that had woken up and like you know we feel super hua today so they <laughs> charged out with me but by the time we got to nine miles there was only three guys left we made the turnaround now we're passing everybody back. 600 dudes on yeah. the way back and we're i mean i'm flying um and uh, the instructors start jabbering, like, if the American finishes first, we're canceling this course. None of you will graduate. Oh, my gosh. So I was like, sweet. Put a bounty on yeah, your head. We're going to downshift, and I'm going to smoke. Oh, like, I'm going home. I'm canceling this course. <laughs> so I take off. And there was one kid that hung with me. The way out is to yeah, win. <laughs> yeah, right? Like, I'm, this, can't, this course is over, boys. Like, pack your bags. We're going home. So, <laughs> so I take off. And there was one guy that hung with me to like 15 miles. And he was number 27. So we were right next to each other, yeah. like in line, the whole course, everything, the whole way through. But he had used like this huge water jug to make weight and then just dumped water out of it. So oh. every step was like, yeah. and so his core and his hip flexors at 15 miles are like, we give, we can't do it anymore. So he started falling back and I was like, come on, man, like, let's, let's, let's at this. least make it close. Like, yeah. come on. And he was like, you I'm out. So I was like, sweep, downshifted, blew through, finished it. I finished first. Those sons of bitches, they didn't cancel the course. <laughs> so, <laughs> Liars. Yeah, they weighed my ruck like 19 times. Oh, yeah, he's five pounds <laughs> over. He's good. Um, but because of that initial event and then uh, because I spoke Portuguese fluently, I made real good rapport with the students real fast. And then tactical knowledge that I brought to the course was well above the average student there right. so i was able to build rapport with the instructors 
real, real quick, um, which was nice because there was a couple different things that kind of set me apart where from being an, an, an outlier foreigner guy right. to, hey, this guy knows his stuff and he can speak Portuguese and he can teach us how to do it. It turned into a... Like and a, he's legit. A, yeah, it turned into a real, real good uh, environment for me to, to learn what they had to offer as well as pass on some of the things that, that I was bringing to that course that wouldn't have been there otherwise. So... Me and the Spaniard finished the ruck, and then the next day was land nav, and he fell off a log, and everybody had to carry a big machete down there. He fell off a log and landed on the handle of his machete and broke, like, three ribs. Oh, my god! So they're like, you're out, man. You can't make it anywhere. So I was the only foreigner after that oh my in the whole class. So the first week, they washed out, like, 170, 175 guys. And then they would wash out another several every week after yeah. that for four months we graduated the graduating number was 62 dudes is what oh I graduated my gosh with. out so, of 600 out of 600 percent yeah it was oh my god it was it was pretty stout so and like a lot of the stuff that was happening was super funny and like the only reason that i graduated was like nobody's gonna believe these stories like they're gonna think oh she's <laughs> making that shit up for sure but <laughs> it's like i promise i was there it happened but <laughs> but i'm the only witness so <laughs> <laughs> i swear yeah, trust me it happened yeah. <laughs> but uh it was super fun and they did i mean crazy stuff The the land nav um was was funny and i ended up being able I'm good at land nav, green beret. That's what you got to do. You got to be yeah. good at land nav. And uh, in the jungle, like everybody thinks of the jungle as like what you see on, you know, the nature channel. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's tertiary, crazy, 120, right. 130 canopy. degrees under the yeah. canopy, but it's straight up and down. It's not flat. Yeah. So it's, they're like, okay, this is my pace count. I got to go here. But like, hey, guys, your pace count varies underweight and if you're going uphill or downhill. So they were just keeping a pace count for flatland. I mean, you guys are. You're, you're, yeah, you're seven kilometers short. Like, you still got yeah. a long way to go. No, 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 this is the spot. And like, I promise it isn't. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, those ten guys don't come back to class. But Maddie Nelson and the crazy three guys that decided to follow that, that one kid that made it the seven more kilometers to the actual point were still in the class. And oh, that, my gosh. That would spread real, real fast uh, throughout the other students. So all so of a sudden, got, you got people in your back pocket. Yeah, like just, hey, what, what do you Stick think with about, him? What do you think about this machine gun position? Oh, I'd move it six inches to the left. You're like, <laughs> that doesn't matter at all. But they're like, okay, let's do it. I'm like, <laughs> so I may have had a little fun and taken a little leniency with some of it, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no harm, no foul. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. It was super fun. So, but yeah, there were there were some crazy things that happened. We did a there was a, a ten mile swim that we did at night. Yeah, that's the that's one I remember. One of their one of their passing courses that you got to do. And uh, I mean, we were always in the, in the river every day. We're always in the Amazon River every day, and it was the rainy season down there, so it was super tall. Uh, I mean, it was just a lot, a lot of water. But the, the Amazon in certain parts, particularly where we were at, we were like four and a half hours by helicopter one way from the oh nearest. My gosh. Anything. And it was like a it was like a day and a half boat ride. So they put us all on a barge, and then you just sit there, and they truck you all the way out there, and then you do a bunch of training for. Uh, we were never in the jungle longer than thirty days in a row, but they it, you never knew when you were getting out. Oh my! So gosh. it was it was there's just no end. Yeah, it was yeah, mentally. It was, there's no yeah, end. eleven days, twenty one days, six days. It, it vary depending on uh, things they had going on in the rear, as well as like what the training schedule was. So it's different every class. It's not like you could get you know a bunch of intel from somebody right. that went before. Right. Um, and I didn't get even until before I went. The last guy that went before I went to that school went 10 years before I went. Oh, my gosh. So, and then since I went in 2009, and I'm still the last guy to go. So, why, so I don't understand. Why would our military send guys down there for that? Would, did you bring that back, that knowledge back, and pass it on? <laughs> Today's episode is brought to you by Silencer Central. Now, if you haven't used a suppressor slash silencer, they're the same thing. If you haven't used them hunting, you need to. I recently did this and I am on board fully. Before Silencer became one of our, Central became one of our sponsors, I was on a hunt, a couple of hunts where they are using them. Here's the advantage, follow up shots. Not only do you get that one surprise shot, you also get a second one because that animal isn't scared of the noise. They may have felt the impact, but they didn't hear the noise. Check them out, it is unreal. They are building the silencers specific for hunters lightweight, short silencers that you can put on any gun. I had an amazing conversation with Brandon Maddox, who is the CEO, founder of Silencer Central. Check that episode out, as well as check silencercentral.com and t let them know that Ike sent you and get set up today. I would love to say that th that oh, was, was this the case. Just a dick measuring it was so they sent some guys to ranger school and they wanted to send somebody to jungle school in oh, return. So gotcha. two two star generals high fived a Brazilian general and a, and a U.S. general high fived each gotcha. other, made the switch. They went to ranger school, which is 
difficult and hard, 100%, right? right? Um, but, like, we had a guy die in the class I was in. We oh had, like, a gosh. crazy stuff happen. It was, yeah. it was, it was, yeah, it was, it was a crazy so, course, but... So what's the deal with the? Tell me about the night swim. So That's crazy. So, I mean, the Amazon's not a place you want to swim in. Period. I can't no, imagine. No, I mean, night. there's crazy fish in there, and they're pulling like real Don't big. Don't pee. Yeah, I mean, three, yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, you get in the water, and you're like, hey, swim to this light, and the light is blocked by the curve of the Earth. It was so far <laughs> out there. We're like, holy crap! So we swim and we swim and we swim, and you're in full uniform with your your LBE belt and your ammo and your rucksack is is all tied on a lanyard behind you, and your rifle's tied to your rucksack, so you're pulling a boat anchor. Oh my god! And you're swimming and you're swimming and nobody's got life jackets on and eventually you started to kind of like parcel yourself out into you know 10 or 11 or 12 right. or eight man groups or whatever it wasn't it, they didn't start that way like the first 10 of yeah, the water it was like was a like, marathon yeah it was just every, like get, go get in. so after they kind of started to separate like that you ended up seeing like hey there was an instructor with a private and a rowboat and they were just going alongside you with like a flashlight pointing at the shore like don't swim over there bunch of eyes oh on the shore gosh. don't swim over here and because it was the rainy season <laughs> and nighttime like 350 pound fish don't give a crap about a bunch of dudes swimming in the water. No. So, and neither does like the Cayman crocodile that's yeah. down there, which is a big, they get pretty big. Yeah. So you'd be swimming and you'd feel all the water underneath you like move. Like, just come was past oh you. You're like, God. this is how I go. Like, this is <laughs> this the is end. It. I'm not going to make it. And I got to pee, but that thing's going to swim with my dick. And I can't, like, <laughs> it was the worst. And then after several hours of swimming, like, oh, we're almost to the light. And then you get to the light and it's just a boat. And it turns the motor on. Takes off. And off it goes back over the curve of the earth. Like, are you serious? So it was 10 miles that we swam oh at night gosh. in the Amazon. And we got to this little muddy island. And they stood us up there. And they're like, hey, where is number 16? Where is he at? Is he taking a dump? Did he fall asleep? Like, where is he? And they were like, oh, we can't find him. We don't know where he is. So the instructor's like, hey, kick the search and rescue team out of there. So these guys whoosh, took off in a little rowboat. And uh, they came back. And they're like, yeah, he's, he's gone. The river monster got him. Oh, you're kidding me. Yeah. And the instructors were like put their hats over their heart, and then put them back on their head. And we're like, all right. Keep on going. The next event is going to be, we're going to build this, and we're going to go. I was like, holy smokes. But the yeah, he's gone. He's Just gone. Disappear. And it's not like he was like, I quit. This is crap. I'm walking home. We're two weeks on foot from the nearest town. Oh, my god. So it was, yeah. It was. Never the, we had a little yeah, we, we had a memorial for him, and they found a rucksack like a week later. But that was. You're kidding That me. was it, man. Yeah. So it was. Well, I've, I've been in the Amazon. That's how I know you don't pee in it. Yeah. Have, mm -hmm. I, don't, I think they call them needlefish or something. Yeah. And they swim up. Yeah. And. and there's no way to get it out. It's surgery, and you never perform ever again. Ever, yeah. So it was, it's, yeah. And they have crazy things there. So the reason I didn't bring anything back is because, so when we go, when we do a school in the U.S. military, you learn a specific, you know, here's the task we need you to right. learn. So you learn those, you practice those. B. And then they put you under food deprivation, sleep deprivation, right? They put you in, in adverse conditions. Right. Then you recall, you have to recall that information that you learned and then apply it to the scenario you're in or mold it to fit the scenario you're in. And then you're graded based off of how well you can right. perform under those conditions. So that's how we do it. They do it different down there. They start sleep depth and food depth day one. So for four months, I got two and a half hours of sleep ish a night. night. That oh was my it. Gosh. So I like I was messed up for months after this course. I was like a toddler. I would like my, you can ask my wife. Like I fell asleep in the potatoes, <laughs> like mid dinner time. <laughs> Done. Meat on my fork, <laughs> out right face down in the gravy. Just a mess. So I learned some really 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 cool things about jungle warfare. I will be damned if I can remember any of them <laughs> because I was so asleep. tired, so tired, and they like. I, Really, really cool things. So that's why I wanted to go back when they offered an instructor position. Right. You had to graduate the then course. You, then you bring it so, back. Yeah, so now I can go back. I can eat. I can sleep. Yeah. I know what I'm doing. And now I can really absorb right. the information that they're putting out. But seventh group wouldn't cut me loose. I had to go back to Afghanistan, and that was, that was all oh she wrote. So, um, but it was, <laughs> it was awesome when I was there. But it was, it was really, I mean, guys were losing their mind because they were just so sleep deprived. Jeez. And then for the first three out of the four months, the food deprivation was – um, you got like a chicken bone that they had boiled all the meat off of, so it yeah. was like real rubbery, and a finger of rice. That was it. Oh my! So gosh. I went in at like a buck ninety, buck ninety five, and I graduated the course at like one sixty. Holy so, yeah, buckets! I was skin, skin and bones, skin and bones when I got out, um, and just just 
looked like ragged ass. That's where Damn I met Brian. Portuguese. Yeah, I went to church and Brian met me at church and he was like, "What is the matter with you?" And I was like, "Oh." <laughs> so, but they, what? they well, do. That's why I was asleep. Yeah. What? <laughs> so, but they have different things. Like one of the things that they do is you can't drink the water out of your canteens in the day. They're still, in the, you know, water's a crutch. You don't need that stuff. Well, actually, you, you kind of do. do. So, uh, but they would go by and they would shake your canteens, and if there was, you know. Slosh. slosh in your canteens then you would get a negative assessment too many negative assessments you're out of the course right 600 to 62 guys when we graduate it's not that many negative assessments and you're out right right um so everybody kept their canteens full and we just cl carried clear surgical tubing in the front pocket of our uniform and then anytime you crossed a creek or went through a body of water you would dump that out and you would suck up whatever water you could because you couldn't drink water during the day oh my gosh so for four months i drank zero like the water in my canteens was purified and i never touched it it stayed there for the entire, entire time yeah and, until the second to last day when you dump them out to do a, a big event that they do where you go it's like two days without sleep one day with uh out any water at all and or it's no it's uh one day without any food at all and 18 hours without any water at all and in oh that God. period you do like a 30 kilometer foot movement and then oh. do a bunch of tests at the end which is like it's very arduous and strenuous and people are falling out left and right yeah i mean we had Pretty close to 200 guys before we started that last little bit, and they all dropped. I mean, they ended to 60. Yeah, 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 dropped down real low. So, jeez. Um, but yeah, so like, I, people like if if you've met me in the past, like I always have monster and something kicking around. Like, oh, how come you drink so much monster? It's because you keep all those parasites at bay, man. I got all kinds <laughs> of crap stuff running around in there. I don't. In there. <laughs> I haven't met yeah. in a long time. Yeah, I don't. If if I stop drinking that stuff, my butt's gonna turn inside <laughs> out and start talking to me in two days. So, I gotta I gotta keep that stuff at bay. Oh <laughs> but so, so you're married yeah kids? do you got yep. kids i do i have three little girls oh you're so, you're learning patience like me oh man it's it's bad news but they are they are a hoot they're so much fun how old are they so they are 10 8 and 4 oh that's awesome i got a yeah. 10 and 12 year old girls oh I'm, I'm i and i didn't grow up with girls I, all the cousins almost all my cousins are males and yeah so i didn't know how to do this but yeah they're fun i oh. got two brothers that's it. Yeah. So, and my wife only has, she's the oldest in her family, but then she has three little brothers. So we don't know. Didn't know anything. Anything. So yeah. we're, yeah, we're still in the deep end of the pool. Just like, tread water, baby. We're going to make it. So it's, Don't pee. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's going to get you. So, so it's, uh, yeah, it was, it's, it's been super fun. I met my wife right after I graduated the Q. So we'd been friends for a long time. We grew up on the same street down here. In, oh, no in, kidding. Yeah. So like we'd have gone to church together. We'd done everything. Um, and I remember when I came home from my mission, I was the, it was the week before Christmas, and she had come down from the University of Utah here to go to church with her family. And I would, like, she walked in, and I was like, holy crap. Like, she grew up and Whoa. got smoking hot. <laughs> and, um, but it never lined up. I was going in the Army, and she was here, and she was, you know, she did study abroad, and I was there and here and whatever. Um, but I, I took her on one date. I came home for another Christmas. It was right after I graduated the Q course. I was a Green Beret, like, you know, top yeah. of my game. Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm it. I'm the man. Yeah. You want to go out? Yeah. <laughs> came home, and, and, and she had a serious boyfriend that was going to propose to her, like, over Christmas at his family's house. And I was like, don't go do that stuff. Like, you should marry me. And she was. You're kidding me. I'm dead serious. She was silly enough to be like, okay. Oh my I'll roll gosh. those dice. And, and it's been 15 amazing she's, years. We've been married for 15 years. She's an angel. She's amazing. Like, she, people ask me all the time, like, oh, how did you do this? Or how did you do that? Like unquestionably she is far tougher than i am i was gone for like 300 to 320 days out of every year while i was in she never made me pick she never threw a fit it was wow. never like i don't understand why you have to do this or you have to do that i ran it out in my 10 years as green beret and because of that i was able to do more in 10 years than most guys will get to do in 20. yeah and at 10 it was like hey it's 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 time to get out my she i was home doing the dishes and my wife told my oldest daughter at the time she was uh six maybe he said, hey, daddy wants to talk to you. And she went and sat down in front of the TV, in front of the computer. And yeah. I was in the kitchen doing dishes. And I was like, all right, like, yeah, let's get out. Yep. So it's time. Yeah. Got out. And uh, now I get to see him every night. And That's awesome. I can't complain at all. That's so cool. Yeah. So she is, she is amazing though. She's so does she work outside the home. She is a uh, certified nurse. She has her bachelor's degree in nursing. She worked here at Salt Lake City at Primary Children's Hospital for a long time. Every time I would deploy, she would box up whatever apartment we were living in uh, and fly home and work there. Uh, cause they just kept the job open for yeah. her. They didn't have to train or anything like that. And then once we had kids, uh, she wanted to just be a, you know, just be a mom. So, yeah. uh, and we still work like my work at Seekins still allows us that type of lifestyle. And she has, she keeps up with her nursing degree and everything else. So she can go back to work at any time that she wants to. But, um, I mean, you know, the deal, little girls oh, are, yeah. aren't 
little for long. No, so and you got to take every moment. Yeah, every moment. So she's having fun doing that, and uh, but when the time comes that she's ready to go back to it, she'll already be ready to rumble. So oh, that's cool. So yeah. Seekins, mm-hmm. walk me through what what's Seek for those that don't know. Who's Seekins? I don't know. Living under a rock, I guess. <laughs> Seekins Precision. Seekins Precision is is, a, is an awesome company to work for. So Glenn Seekins started it back in 2004 making scope rings on a CNC machine that he rented time on after his full-time day job because he <laughs> broke a set of steel rings on a hunt and thought to himself, there's got to be, be a better. That's how yeah, it's got to be a more lightweight, better way to do this. And so he started with scope rings, and he put them up on, like, Sniper's Hide. Yeah. Um, and once upon a time, like, 20 sets of rings was a huge order, right? <laughs> but it's gone from that to they, they started getting into small parts and accessories for ARs, and then they went all the way into full-blown ARs and were real big in, like, the three-gun world for a yeah. long time. Yeah. And then they were sitting around in 2017, and Glenn and the Mr. Lucas Mattoon and Mr. Eli. Mr. Lucas Mattoon runs the quality control department at Seekins, and Eli... Uh, Nightingale's the lead programmer there. Okay. And they were complaining of like, man, we got all these got all these awesome gas guns. I don't have a I don't have a hunting rifle this year that I want to take out yeah. and hunt with. It's got yeah. this problem or that problem or this con or that con. And they were like, Well, we got a Brazilian dollar machine shop out there. Why don't we just build make this one? one? So they made the original Pro Hunter one, the PH one, and it turned into the flagship of the company overnight. Really? It was, yeah. It, and we still today, like the, the new version is the PH2, and we've made some updates and some changes and a couple different things um, to, to continue to better the product, but we still just cannot make them fast enough. Really? Yeah. So it's, it's super cool to see it come on. And then I got hired on uh, right in 2018 after SHOT Show, yep. which is a banana story. Glenn had a sales team that was all kind of outsourced guys. None of them lived in Idaho. None of them were there. Um, and he watched them in the booth at shot show and realize like they don't know any of the names of my products they don't know what their capabilities are and, and a few other things um and so he fired him <laughs> right on the spot yeah like done yeah pack your stuff you guys hit yeah. the road and then was talking to brian morgan that night like i don't know what i'm gonna do like i just i just i'm kind of setting myself back here and he's like i know a, I, I know somebody I'm, i got I'm, a guy yeah yeah hold on i'll fly him out here so i flew out right after shot show and interviewed with glenn and it was lucky enough to fit the bill and, and be what they needed and then was able to kind of green beret some of the other stuff. Like, yeah. oh, we need somebody to run this. I can do that. We need somebody to run a customer service team and the in-house sales team. And what about marketing? Can you do that? And like, I don't know how to do any of that stuff, but I'll figure it out. Like, yeah. I'll, I'll find a way to find a way to make something work. What I mean, when I first met you so, was, I had to been, geez, it had been 2019 probably mm-hmm. when I first met you. I think so. And you're like, I said, what do you do there? You go, I don't know. I really don't know. Yeah. I, just, I just make sure Mr. Glenn's phone doesn't ring. That's what my job is. Yep, pretty much. So it's it's yeah. I joke all the time. I think I think my official title is the director of business development, which is super fancy for like, you know, I do help with product development. I help make sure this is gonna. We got to unload raw material from a truck. Oh, it just means you're really good yeah. at taking yeah. hats on and off. Yes, right. Got to wash Glenn's truck on the weekend. Like whatever <laughs> needs to happen, I'm that guy. Which is which is super fun to be able to step into that position and perform for somebody of the character and caliber of of Mr. Glenn Seekin and be you know considered hey that's 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 glenn's right hand man if you need it done go talk to Matt. Yeah. which is super super cool and I'm, I'm honored to be there with uh you know mr mattoon and mr nightingale because that's that's the that's the crew of yeah. that's, that's 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 our job is to make sure he gets to do what he wants to do because he's put the time in and, to, and, and, to and things have, have changed now. slightly there and it's better yeah yep so we, so we were uh an llc for a long time um and then we recently changed to an esop okay. which means we're employee owned yeah. which is super super cool so i have part of the company my brother danny that does sales has part of the company the guy sweeping the shop floor has part of the company um and there's a lot of advantages to that uh as an employee that's also a part owner in the company you're in we get awesome production out of the guys that that, that are yeah. working there because yeah. now they're you know, they got more skin in the game than they had before. Um, as well as like the long-term benefits of being an ESOP versus just a standard LLC with a 401k or, or, or whatever program, uh, we were running before. There's just, just the monetary benefit is so much better in the long game for all of our employees. So it's, it's really cool. It's a fun spot to work. That's awesome. And you guys can't build them fast enough. We really can't. We're, we're trying. I I love to not have it be my problem as a sales guy. I love to make sure it's the machine shops problem. (laughs) They're trying to catch up. They had a 10,000 square feet to our warehouse. They had like 11 more machines. We bought five machines machines this last week wow. uh for for some more additions that are coming and we got all kinds of robots in the shop now doing stuff so we haven't had to lose anybody because of automation we've just allowed everybody to be more twice production as, yeah the twice same. as efficient with their time yeah so it's been fun we've tripled our old production line last year and we quadrupled what we tripled Jeez. moving into this year so it's it's 
crazy the amount of parts that are coming off, the amount of raw material we get in, and then the amount of guns that are leaving the shop yeah. at a weekly basis has been, you know, the changes have been staggering and super fun to be a part of that that That's rocket great. launch that, that Seekins is on right now. Well, and they're, they're, they're a really cool company, really cool rifles. I mean, I've shot the AR that, that time at Everly stock. Mm -hmm. uh, Glenn Everly actually shot his deer with me this year with one of your rifles. Mm -hmm. Epic. I mean, he didn't need much. It was like an 80-yard shot or some silly thing, but awesome rifles yeah awesome. they're super fun we and uh, that's it's been fun to do stuff for for people like that in the industry that have known glenn seekins and the name seekins for a long time and they've you know now we're in a position where it's it's fun to give back to those people that have that have helped along so we've done yeah. stuff for glenn and uh, eberly and a few of the, few other people like that yeah. it's been really really enjoyable for yeah. us so three questions you've been thinking about them i have they're, all right they're deep ones do, man. You, do you do you care which way we go i don't you send it right. I'll, I'll, so, I'll spin it off so what's the one thing that Maddie Nelson can teach our audience? What, what is the one thing that you go, you know, this is something you guys need to be thinking about? Um, I, think it would, I think it would have to be the use of time because it's the only thing we have. I don't, like, I don't like the phrase, like, you only live once, like YOLO, right? Like, that, that's kind of irresponsible as yeah. far as I'm concerned, right? Yeah. Like, that's going to make you, oh, if I'm, if I'm YOLOing, then I'm, you know, I'm making poor decisions that I'm going to regret tomorrow if I don't live that long. Right. So it's not that, but it, the efficient use of time, where, because that's, that's really the only thing we have. Are you spending enough time with your kids? Are you not locked into your phone all the time? Are you, are you being the good husband or the good parent or the good son, the good brother that you should be the efficient use of that time makes for a good story and the story is the only thing that we get to leave here with we're that's not right. taking anything else that's so right. if it's not the life you want then work to make it the life you want and if if you get there and you realize that's super cool but i would like to change it or tweak it then do it because this time is the only time you get and the only thing you're living you're leaving this life with is the story that you present it's and your if, legacy yeah and if if that story is i did video games and and social media my entire life that's yeah. a that's a tough story to tell and have it be interesting but yeah. you know i was a tour guide in alaska i was a green beret uh i contracted for the air force for a while and now i'm doing you know working at seekins precision and i get to be a cowboy and i'm yeah. a father and i'm a husband and i have all, all these things that that i've dedicated time to and hopefully i'm i'm doing that appropriately so that when I do check out because we never know when our right when the last day we don't is. know the stamp so so when my timed card is punched at least I get to leave here with a cool story I got to do the things that I wanted to do and I made it happen on my timeline and there's a lot of excuses that people will I can't do this or I can't do that or I'm blocked by this or I'm blocked by that you just have to do it yeah it's your time that's all you get is this time so make it the time that you want and make it the story that you want to tell that's awesome. So that kind of rolls into the next question, and you, you might have just answered this, but what are you going to be thinking about on your deathbed? If you have the opportunity, and it's not quick, if you have the opportunity, you're laying there, and you know you have hours or days or months, mm -hmm. what, what, what is Maddie Nelson going to be thinking about? I, I hope that, that, that if that is the case and the opportunity, that I can look back on the time that I have used yeah. and realize that I have used my time with what I think would be useful and, mm -hmm. and in making a good story. So I hope that I'm not laying there regretting like, oh, I could have changed this or I could have changed that. Well, I I've, sure wish I would have worked longer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right? Like, yeah, I wish I would have taken more 20 hour days. Um, so, and missed more softball games or whatever. Like, the, yeah, so I hope that, that, that that's not an issue because I'm using my time and I, I go at every day with what we just talked about. Yeah. But, but what, what I do hope is that I will have passed on to my children and hopefully their children and their spouses a good sense of who they are and that they too can live their own story. Yeah. Have I prepared them as a father for the daughter, for the, for the woman that they're going to be? Um, have I been a good example of what they should be looking for in a husband? Yes. Yes. Um, and, and subsequently their children, are they passing those things on to their kids? I think if I continue to live my life the way that I am, I won't regret any of the time that I have spent. But I will worry, I think, about having been a good enough father and a good enough example and having taught them the correct skills to be a successful person yeah. uh, in their own right. So yeah. I think that's what I'll be that's, thinking that's about awesome. on my deathbed. That's, that's deep. That's really deep. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, so I'm going to ask you a follow-up question. Do you think there's ever a point in parenting that that doesn't, isn't a worry? Do you ever think you're like 35 year old kids? They're killing it with their kids and their careers, and you're like, "Yeah, I've made it." Do you think that ever happens? 
Looking at my parents, no. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. My parents right? still worry about yeah, me. My, right, mom, like, my mom calls me all the time. You, you okay? Yeah. I'm, I'm good, mom. Yeah, you've been on the road a lot. You're taking yeah. your vitamins? Yeah, you're drinking exactly. water? Yeah. Like, I know you drag those energy drinks. You better be drinking water. You're going to get kidney stones. You're going to get old one day. That's right. That's um, right. So I, I don't think so. I think you're always someone's kid, yeah. and they're always, they're always going to look out for you. And if, if you're in the unfortunate position where you've lost your parents, whether it's an old age or a young yeah. age, there's somebody that yeah. that's going to fill that role and be that step in parent that's that's going to worry about you. I yeah. think that's that's just part of being a, a responsible human is you worry about yeah. you worry about your kids. That's right. So, so. last question, hunting question. We, we didn't talk much we about did, hunting. We didn't talk oh, but which is I, good. That's we, that's my intent. But I do love it. So So why do you hunt? <laughs> I hunt because it is a fantastic way for me to unplug. I'm plugged in all the time. I'm a pretty wired person. I'm pretty oh, hyper, and I'm on the run, um, making sure that. As Aaron that, Snyder just said, "Man, you got you're full energy." <laughs> yeah, yeah. He met me for about six seconds. I was like, "I can take a step back. We, gotta, we need a little bit more buffer here." Uh, but <laughs> um, it's it's a great opportunity for me to unplug mentally. Yeah. I don't have cell phone service. I don't have this. I don't have that. I'm I'm literally just out there getting back to like the things I loved about green, being a green beret land nav instruction of these things to my kids uh and and stuff like that so i love the opportunity to go out and unplug and then be one with nature and then hopefully be successful in a hunt and it's it's not something that i take lightly i've yeah. never looked down yeah. you know i've never looked through an optic i've never looked through some sites at a, at a living creature that god has made and has done no wrong to me the state department yeah. didn't come down and say you know like this guy's got to go because yeah. he's made some terrible choices <laughs> um <laughs> But to, yeah, to, <laughs> this bull elk has made some horrible choices yeah. during the rut. Yeah, this guy is out. So <laughs> the president called. That's the guy. Um, so you know, I've never gone into the woods with you know that face on my forearm. Like, okay, yep. this is the guy we're looking for. Right. Uh, so so I I've had more pause about pulling that trigger than maybe anything else that I've been asked to do in in the service. But it's because it's a very spiritual moment. That's it a is. creature there that has you know, been living a good life and is, is, is not going to die well, which is why conservation is a big deal. They're going to starve to death. They're going to do something that's, it's just not, you know, getting eaten alive by a wolf or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a great way to go. Yeah. So, uh, so being able to, you know, end it quickly and ethically and, yeah. and provide for my family with that meat that we're harvesting from that animal is, is a really, really unique and genuine experience. Yeah. And it's, that's what I love about it. I love getting out in the woods and unplugging. And then I love that spiritual connection that you get with you know whoever you want to call him god the maker whatever yeah um getting that connection with with god and the things that he has made yeah 100 um, and allowing I mean, that's what they were designed for they were designed to provide for yeah. us and our families and being able to harvest that animal and then have that for my family is is a really cool experience yeah. that i hope guys get to get to experience yeah that's awesome that's very good. Well, I appreciate it, Maddie. Thank you for coming on. Thanks for sharing your story. <laughs> it's awesome one. to be here. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, yeah, thank so you. much. Uh, you know, good luck here at the show. It's it's first day. We've, we'll see what happens. Right? Yeah, I think it'll be a zoo. So it, it'll it, it'll be super fun. It always is. Yeah, <laughs> Saturday's crazy. <laughs> right. Yeah. Here they come. <laughs> <laughs> so, I well, appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, folks. Thanks for listening today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. You got to hang out with some of the people that I think are most the most interesting I've ever met. And remember, fair chase is the only way to hunt and take trophy big game. See you next time right here on Eastman's Podcast Edition.